Hi, today. Welcome to another episode of Hearthstone Deck Tech, where we interview some of the better players in the game and touch into their insights and strategies when playing Hearthstone. Uh, today, we got a special de- uh, special guest, and it's a little different from our normal podcast where we talk about people who play on the ladder um, or content creators. Today, we have someone who has won one of the specialist tournaments, and uh, as you've heard in the podcast in the previous episodes, the difficulties and challenges and how fatiguing one of these tournaments can be. Um, so I'd like to introduce Honest Zabe from Crescent Esports. Zabe, welcome to the show. Hey, Kate. Hey, Ken. Thanks for having me on today. I'm really excited to do this. This is actually the first time I'm doing something like this, so I'm, I'm sure it'll be a blast. I'm, well, we are glad, definitely glad to have you on here. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your history playing the game? Yeah, so I picked up the game... I think one of my friends showed it to me my freshman year of college. So that was about maybe five years ago. And I played off and on. Uh, I went for Legend a few times, but never was really serious because of school. And then started med school this year and wasn't sure how serious I was going to be. Didn't play for a while. But then around December this past month, I decided that I was really going to go all the way into it and be serious. So since then, I've been practicing really hard, trying to be the best that I can be. So when you say practice, um, we're talking about in terms of lining yourself up strategy-wise to be prepared to win one of the specialist tournaments, correct? Like, that's what we're going for? Yeah, for the most part. Um, for the majority of the year, well, I guess not the majority of the year, I guess until maybe March or so, uh, specialist wasn't a thing. I'm not sure exactly when it happened, but before then I was trying to go for ladder finishes. Mm-hmm. But after the uh, change was made, I was practicing for specialist, mostly on ladder. But lately I've been doing more uh, friendly matches to practice like specific matchups. Um, and that's been about for like, the ma- the last uh, month or maybe two. And that's kind of paid off for you like in the past two weeks, right? Because you just finished winning a qualifier? Yeah, it definitely has. I think one thing that's really important for specialists is understanding matchups and your win conditions in certain matchups because every deck has its strengths and weaknesses, obviously. And to win a qualifier, you're either going to have to high roll like crazy, which is something you don't really want to depend on, or you're going to figure have to figure out how you can consistently win against the decks that you're not supposed to win against. So, for example, I was playing Cyclone Mage, and mid-range hunter is a really hard matchup, so I played that matchup a decent amount just to figure out how I can get that closer to a neutral matchup instead of the uh, I think it's like 38% is the win rate that Cyclone Mage has against mid-range hunter in qualifiers. Wow, wow, wow! Um, and you know, so you just won one of those specialist tournaments. Like, what is the day like? Like, how many how many do you think you've played before you actually won this this final one that you did? Ooh, that's uh, that's really tough to answer. Um, when they stopped, when when they just had it every day instead of just the weekends, I was playing a little more. Um, but now, I was playing about somewhere between five and ten a weekend. It really depends on how far you make it into the earlier ones. Because if you don't have a loss when the next one starts you usually just keep playing but if you pick up a loss and the next qualifier starts you usually just drop that one and play in the next one um it's really hard for me to put a number on it i'd say somewhere around 50 is probably around where i was but i'm not 100 percent sure bro 50 specialist tournaments that, that I, I that's think what you said. it might, be, it might be a little Oh, but man. this this is this is since like uh, May around May, so it's holy cow. It's been like three or four, but some of them don't take long at all because yeah, you start off zero into, one. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you you start off zero one, and the next one starts, and you just drop the first one, or you get your second loss early, and you just drop because mm-hmm. unless you start off like six and zero, oh, if you pick up that second loss, it's a very low chance that you're going to be able to make top eight, but. It's it's hard for me to put a number on it. I could be totally off. It could be 
I it's definitely not 30 because some weekends I played in eight or ten, but um, it could be well over 50. Honestly, I'm not. I'm really not sure. But there were weeks that I wasn't able to play, so it's it's hard for me to say exactly how much. Wow, but that's that that is a grind, though. So yeah, I mean, but that you're the first person to actually tell me that that was their strategy because some people they were telling me like, yeah, so I devote a day, right? Like I'll devote my Saturday and I'm, I'm going to enter this one specialist tournament. You know, I, I do well in the first like six rounds or seven rounds. And then, you know, I get like, you know, 10 and 0 or whatever. And I end up dropping like the last round or last two rounds and it sucked or whatever. Right. But, uh, you know, you're the first one who's told me like, well, you know what? Like you just start, uh, you know, with inch, investment into like every every available tournament that you can get into and you know just drop the lower scores and and stick with the the one that you're progressing well on so that's pretty interesting that's pretty wild and you played cyclone mage for for most of these um actually no i so so going on your first point most people who are grinding qualifiers this is what they choose to do just to increase their chances because um it's just it's such a grind that playing in the long qualifiers without having a chance of getting top eight is not really worth it because mm -hmm. by the end of the weekend, you're just so drained. Um, I'm, some people were grinding much more than I was. I only played on Americas and Asia because I felt like that meshed with my uh, sleep schedule the best. Mm -hmm. um, I would just wake up and play the 11 a.m. one and then play until the 8 o'clock and 11 p.m. ones on Asia and the Europe ones, my time would be 3 a.m. and 7 a.m., so that's when I would sleep. But I know people who didn't actually sleep, but they would just take naps in between rounds. Wow. or Yeah, rounds or qualifiers or whatever, and actually would play in, in as many as they could. And if they picked up that first loss or the second loss, um, they would just go ahead and drop. But um, sorry, what, what was your second point? I uh, uh, Whether you played Cyclone Mage for... Oh, right. So when qualifiers first started, it was the uh, mid-range hunter meta, and it just felt like a mistake to not bring mid-range hunter, even though everybody was playing mid-range hunter. So at the time, I was also playing mid-range hunter. But um, after, I, I guess it was um, an expansion came out. I, I think it was that's when Rise of Shadows was released. Mm -hmm. um, I started playing... I played mid-range hunter for still a little bit longer just because I was very comfortable with it. But then I realized that bomb warrior was just very, very, very strong. And yeah. even the matchup said it was supposedly unfavored. It probably wasn't that unfavored. So for example, a lot of people think that mid-range hunter is favored against it, but I think if the warrior is playing well, then it's probably still warrior favored. And also when Bomb Warrior first started uh, gaining popularity, people were thinking it was more like a control deck. And the quicker you realize that if you play it like a tempo deck, it, its power level is just so much higher, the quicker mm -hmm. your results just skyrocket. So um, I practiced it and figured out that you should be playing it a little more aggressively. And because of that, I was doing pretty well with it for a while. But then I... Um, I left for a leadership program for about two weeks. And then when I came back, Cyclone Mage had just blown up. Before that, it was kind of a meme deck. Mm -hmm. But then people realized that uh, having double Frost Nova just changes the deck completely. And before that, it was just, it didn't have the Frost Nova. And then it had one Frost Nova. And people were not really sure about why it was in there. But then, I don't know who it was, but someone tried the second Frost Nova and realized that that's actually a huge win condition to just Freeze keep freezing. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And even like in the mirror matchup, whoever plays the last Frost Nova usually wins. So when I got back from the leadership program and realized that Cyclone Mage had such a high power level, I decided that I wanted to try to play that, which had its risks because it's such a difficult deck to play mm -hmm. that most people aren't playing it at a high enough level for it to actually be worth it even though its power level is so high you really have to be playing it at a, at a high level for uh to get the payoff otherwise you may as well just be playing something else but that was around early july is when i got back from from the leadership con conference and started to uh play cyclone mage so that was the first time i touched the deck 
Cool. Uh, man, you know, I'm so excited now to really talk about Cyclone Rage. Because, you know, in the, the past few months, I've actually, like, really not played a lot of Hearthstone. Uh, like, I, my, my rank has kind of, like, degraded quite a bit, like, on, on the ladder. Because I just haven't been, you know, logging in, playing it enough. But, um, you know, I always see people talking about, like, oh, Cyclone Rage is just, it's just so ridiculously strong. Uh, Luna's Pocket Galaxy is just, it's just so broken right now. Um, and, you know... I, I always find like or I always see like a comparison to the deck to you know something like I guess I guess I guess you would say like Patron Warrior or something where like it kind of wins against most of the field like almost everything on the field but like you really do have to be a strong pilot of it to in order to kind of reap those results you can't just like queue the deck up like just net deck it with no experience and just be like okay yeah I'm gonna I'm gonna kill the ladder. Um, so I'm really excited yeah, exactly. to talk about it. But before we get into that, I want to ask two more questions just about um, like your own goals and stuff now that you've qualified for uh, Bucharest and um, you know maybe a little bit about the specialist like uh, strategy that you took into this. Um, so like yeah, now that you've qualified, uh, like well, what else would you like to do in the game? I guess. So I think one thing that helped me a lot the uh, last month or so I, is something that Fino once said that I really took to heart. Um, so Fino actually used to not be a great player. He was kind of a meme, honestly. <laughs> when he when he started doing well, he was joking about it because he never really had tournament uh, success. And then someone asked him, well, what changed? And he said, um, well, instead of worrying about my results, I just played to get better. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't care about whether I was finishing or whether I was actually doing better in tournaments because then you become very results oriented and that's not something that's uh, conducive to improving. And that's something I've tried to do the last couple of months. I've just uh, really focused on just becoming better and having positive takeaways from as many matches as I can, whether it's ladder or uh, playing friendlies or whatever. And, um, it, it was tough playing qualifiers because it's really hard to lose a qualifier and just say, you know what, that's okay. How do you, uh, you know, I, a, a lot of people do mention like, you know, you, you shouldn't be results oriented and you should play for, um, you know, self-improvement in the game. Um, but typically it, it's difficult to be optimistic after losing a game. And I know like a, a common you know, like the common thing is like you, if you lose a game, especially like the one that's maybe debatable, you could have probably won. Like you just look at the replay initially to see like, okay, well, what should I have done here to, to win? But what are other ways that you can take positive takeaways from these types of matches? Like if you lose in a tournament or you lose a, a match on ladder, like uh, how are you s remaining optimistic? Yeah, yeah. So, that, so, so that's what I was about to say. It is, it is really tough to lose, and especially when you feel like when you know that there's not that much time left to qualify or you know maybe get a finish or whatever it is. But um, the the important thing is recognizing that there's not necessarily time lost when you lose, but that you can actually learn a lot from your losses. Mm -hmm. So um, it it is very difficult. But, and th there's really no trick to it other than just telling yourself that it's not productive at all to not have that mindset. Um, it's, for example, with qualifiers, it's a loss of an entire weekend. If you just play qualifiers, you don't win and you don't take anything away from it. So if, you're, if you want to be serious about improving, um, you have to be able to reflect and gain from your losses otherwise it's just going to be lost time so there's no trick to it it's always going to be difficult to have a loss not get tilted and actually look at it in a uh, constructive way mm -hmm. but i think i think it's just something you have to tell yourself otherwise that time is is not going to be um productive for you sure all right man let's let's just jump into this specialist uh deck list that you have uh cyclone mage um for those of you who are not watching the YouTube video, uh, I will have the deck code in the comments for at least for the primary deck. Um, but before we get into the inner workings of Cyclone Mage, can you just tell me why you chose the list that you have as the primary list and uh, what the secondary yeah, actually, and tertiary lists were for? 
there is there is a lot of back and forth with um, coming up with the the lineup. The thing the thing with specialists and qualifiers is a lot of people don't really think about how they're constructing their lineup. A lot of it is just net decking. Mm-hmm. So you'll see a lot of this lineup that um, I ended up qualifying with because a lot of grandmasters played it and a lot of quali- uh, a lot of people qualified with it. Um, so I actually tried some different things. I tried a uh, halftime scavenger in my primary be- because there was a time where Rogue was about 38% of all of the decks that were being played in qualifiers, which was absolutely insane. Yeah. So my thinking was, if I have halftime scavenger in my primary, I can increase my chances against Rogue, not, not need to waste a sideboard, because having a sideboard for Rogue where you're only bringing in two cards kind of feels like uh, it's a waste of a sideboard. Mm-hmm. Um, but that didn't work out for two reasons that I realized. Uh, one is the way that I was thinking about it was 38% of all decks being rogue means that most players are p- playing rogue, but that's not true. It's still not most players, and you're more likely to play something else other mm. than rogue. Mm. Um, it's actually just 38%. Also, that ended up dropping a lot to around 20% um, over th- over the weeks. And um, so having Halftime Scavenger in my primary was actually detrimental because it wasn't good against other matchups. And also what it, another big thing that it did was it forced me to play Antonitis against Rogue, which was actually detrimental. So it was worse than just having a dedicated sideboard. Actually. So you have the, you have the Rogue sideboards, not only so you can bring in cards that are important, which are the scavengers, but also to take out Antonitis, which is a very bad, a very bad card in the matchup. And then, uh, so yeah, the the sideboard is for uh, the secondary is for Rogue with the two um, halftime scavengers, which are just really good for a couple of reasons. The two main reasons being Rogue had a lot of three health minions that they were running, so they were running blink foxes, they were running uh, burglars, and spirit of the shark. So halftime scavenger just dealt with that really well and it couldn't get walk the plank or something like that so you could basically always guarantee that you were killing mm. a minion and sometimes you could get the overkill for the armor which would help a lot but on top of that when the rogue would sideboard they would sideboard into a removal heavy package so you had to shift away from the giant strategy because it was just very risky to just drop a giant early yeah. and you really were only dropping a giant if you're coupling it with um conjurer's calling or something like that so this allows you to have a really powerful play by dropping the scavenger on four maybe and then if you had Kaggar conjurers on five it was game winning so you mm-hmm. kind of shifted away from going with the giant strategy in the secondary and also it allowed you again to take out that antonitis and then the tertiary um was for warrior because they sideboard into also a removal heavy package where they're bringing in two super colliders, two big gain hunters, and a second brawl because most warriors were just running one brawl in their primary because it's not very good against hunter and it's not very good against rogue. Mm -hmm. And of course, all these things have changed now because we have different cards. It's the new expansion, but this is just what was going on then. So in your tertiary, you brought some heavier stuff. You brought two twilight drakes in because most of the time they only had one spellbreaker if any and you could just play it out and it would be really difficult for them to deal with and you added the two astromancers for similar reasons and then you added the harrison which is actually a really interesting tech um because it's like it's reacting to their sideboard it's not just reacting to mm-hmm. their primary i guess and that's specifically for the super collider um so the idea with this is you have more consistent threats and you try to force the removal as early as possible hmm. because the earlier you um, rem- uh, use, force them to use the removal, the earlier you can just play very aggressively and not play around extra removal and yeah. then hopefully be able to pressure them down. Sick. All right. So Cyclone Mage, like what, what are the like primary strategies here with the deck? Like uh, in general, if the matchup is 
slower? Like, w are you looking at just conjurers calling a couple of giants? And if the matchup is versus something that's very aggressive, um, are you just looking to stall the board into like flipping seven, eight um, giants or something? The, uh, the uh, what is it called? The um, the priest card or the seven, eight taunt guy. Yeah, the uh, Grave Horrors. There you go, Grave Horrors. Yeah, so it, this is one thing I really enjoyed about the deck. It is super um, dependent on not only the matchup, like like you just brought up, but also dependent on your draw and what your hand is telling you. So for slower matchups, like you said, usually dropping a giant, um, depending on which matchup it is, depending on how good they're, single removal single target removal is you might want to just drop a giant as early as possible or you might want to uh, drop a giant and then play conjurer's calling along with it but some of the faster decks you might not have that um, opportunity so you're going for something more like a big cyclone turn and just uh, trying to stall with freezes and mirror images and things like that but the thing that i learned that really helped me improve with the deck is learning what my hand was telling me instead of having a specific line in my head going into the match i would look at my hand and try to understand what my win condition was given what i had so mm -hmm. for example if you have um sources apprentice and a cyclone and you're getting beaten down very hard very very quickly by an aggressive deck your your inst uh, your uh, instinct might be to just try to play out your minions, hopefully stop a little bit of pressure. But I, I started to recognize, and it, it's hard to give you s exact specific examples because you know it's always dependent on what the board state is, what your hand is, what you think they might have in their hand. Mm -hmm. But for so given the apprentice like cyclone example, usually I would wait for. You know, drawing banana buffoon for bananas, mm -hmm. a mirror image, Evo, something like that. Because instead of just trying to play my minions out and fight for board, you really have to swing it back really hard. So oftentimes yeah. what you're doing is um, playing Sources Apprentice, mirror image, magic trick, Ray of Frost, Ray of Frost, banana, banana, Evo, Cyclone. And that's mm -hmm. how you're winning the game, not just playing your apprentice and then playing this. Stay and alive play. or whatever, yeah. Yeah, exactly. But again, that's that's what's so interesting about the deck because in a lot of matchups, playing Sorcerer's Apprentice on two is actually a really great play. Mm. And that's that's what I really loved about the deck because it's so difficult and because you're always having to think about your turns four or five turns ahead and having to read your hand, figure out what it's telling you and think about how your hand interacts best with their deck. It really teaches you a lot about the game as a whole and just uh using your resources as best as possible and i think i improved a lot from playing the deck so typically like in general what are some cards that you are always looking to keep i mean maybe not always but like a good majority of matchups you're looking to keep some of these cards in the mulligan and like what are things that you never ever keep i guess so yeah i think i think saying the word always actually is not as bad as you might think because um it with with some decks or maybe with most decks a lot of cards are not kept all the time and you're usually thinking about what your um what the matchup is but with cycle mage i realized that you almost always wanted to keep your power cards so cyclone was almost always a keep maybe the only time i wouldn't keep it is going first against warrior but even then sometimes i would do it sorcerer's apprentice i think i always kept it Arcane Intellect, I almost always kept it. Um, I started to realize that even though people think that Pocket Galaxy can be a pretty big detriment against some of the slower decks, I mean, some of the faster decks, mm -hmm. getting Pocket Galaxy and just going really hard with a Luna or something is how you win the game oftentimes. So I was, keep, I was keeping Pocket Galaxy more often than not. And then Stargazer Luna is just an amazing card, and I was keeping Luna more often than not. But... Really, those cards are what I always wanted to see. And then 
And then there were some things you had to think about after that. So you could keep, if you already had a giant in your hand for matchups that you keep giant, which would be some of the slower matchups, mm -hmm. warrior, you'd keep it against mage, but you wouldn't typically keep it against um, hunter. Rogue, it was kind of iffy on ladder, but specialist, you could maybe keep it in the primary, but probably not after you sideboard out. But if you already had a giant or if you already had a cyclone, you could start thinking about cards that help you play further into that line. So mm -hmm. if you had either one of those cards, you could keep an evocation. If you had a giant and you were on the play, maybe you could keep a banana buffoon to make your hand size bigger. Mm -hmm. And uh, you could kind of look at your hand, uh, what you were being offered in the mulligan, and keep a few cards together that synergize that way but other than that you were really just keeping your power cards cool um you know before we jump into a couple games with this deck um you know i want to thank you for jumping on the show and, and giving us a little insight into your specialist experience and and just uh growing as a player in general is there anything you want to say to people about you know people who enjoy the game of hearthstone or, or trying to get into the game competitively i guess uh in in what way uh you know like i don't know advice or encouragement on on uh you know if they're having any difficulties reaching their kind of goals in the game whether it be qualifying for something or i don't know hitting a rank on ladder yeah so i actually i don't think i improved for about maybe a year or two i was playing a decent amount not not a ridiculous amount but I, I wasn't really improving for a very long time. But these last two months, I think the amount I improved was absolutely tremendous. I think I'm a totally different player from who I was two months ago. And that really was just because I made sure I wasn't autopiloting. I made sure I was thinking about the right things during the uh, during my games. Um, one One mistake that I was making before is just thinking about things that didn't really matter thinking too hard about what was in their hand things like that when i really should just be thinking how do i win this match how do i lose this match what are their key plays what are my key plays and mostly limiting it to that and the most important thing was just re reflecting um and reflecting can be pretty hard because you you make the plays that you make because obviously because you think they're the right place. So looking at your replays can be, it can be a little difficult to analyze them and actually have a takeaway. Because like I said, you make the plays that you make because you think they're good sure. plays. Yeah. But instead of looking at your replays, looking at each specific turn and figuring out exactly what you could have done on those awkward turns, which is something that is good, I found it very helpful to just after the match just think about how i felt about it think about what turn felt like the everything uh swung and then look at maybe how i could have played that differently or okay i lost this game why did i lose and then just going from a simple question like that like oh i got pressured really hard then i would look at okay well should i have played my minions on the board harder should i have saved my stuff so i could have swung the board really hard things like that just as soon as each game was done, asking myself why I lost or why I won, and then trying to answer those questions and just have at least like one small takeaway that I think would um, maybe benefit me in the future. And then I would test it out. So, for example, against Hunters, I'm not 100% sure what, what the correct call is still, but I started experimenting with just if they played a one drop on one, so a 1-1, one, one, I started experimenting with whether coining out a cyclone, which would just give you one spell, mm -hmm. was worth it just to kind of stop them from getting a hyena on two and mm -hmm. uh, kind of steamrolling like that. Yeah. And it, it worked well. I'm not 100% sure if that's better than just keeping your cyclone for a big turn, but just doing things like that. So what I did there was I recognized why Midrange Hunter is so good against Cyclone Mage, which is they just put a lot of pressure on you. And then... There's a really, uh, the mid game is kind of awkward where neither of you are doing that much, but then they have inevitability over you with, with Zul'jin. So I recognized what I needed to do, which was win board. And then I asked myself, okay, well, how can I do that? And one way I could try to do that is with Cyclone. So then I would see if it worked. 
And if it worked, then you figured out something that you didn't know before. If it didn't work, then you think about another way you can do it. Okay, so now I know that mid-range hunter is pressing me hard. I know that playing cyclone early isn't good. So now what's another thing I can try? And then just constantly asking yourself that question and answering those questions, testing out your answers, and then building a different plan accordingly is how you continue to get better. But it's very, very easy to autopilot and not think about games in between them. It's it's really easy to say, oh, I lost that game because of luck. Oh, I won that game, so I don't really need to think about it. But even just 30 seconds in between each game, just ask yourself how you won or how you lost, and then try to let that affect your gameplay in the future. Cool. Um, so, you know, I, I know you're, you're talking a little bit about uh, how you can address different issues and different matchups and to help, you know, garner new information and, and generate new strategy or lines of play that maybe you didn't know before with the new expansion out. I mean, so much of this has changed, right? Like, do you still feel, feel like that galaxy mage or uh, cyclone mage uh, is a strong deck and are there, are there new cards that you are testing out or new matchups that you're finding very difficult or uh, you know, what, what are your thoughts now that there's just so much new stuff out here? So I actually haven't been playing Cyclone Mage because I feel like I don't necessarily need to be practicing it right now. I'd like to be trying different things to see if I can uh, get good with different decks. So I've been playing a little bit of uh, other Mage decks and Combo Priest. So interestingly, there's actually a few Mage decks that are probably Tier 1 right now. Mm -hmm. So you have Reno Mage, you have... Um, the two different variants of Big Spell Mage. One has Sandwich, uh, Naga Sandwich, that is, mm -hmm. and the other list doesn't have that. But those are those are very good decks. And then, of course, you have Cyclone Mage. So no one's playing Cyclone Mage right now because it's not a new deck, so you don't really see it on ladder. But I don't think that means that it's not very strong. I think I think everyone still knows that Cyclone Mage might be the best deck in the game just because of sheer power level and just the things that it can do are absolutely insane so i still think cyclone mage has to be one of the strongest decks even if it's not a perfect fit in the meta i think the the power level of the deck is too high for it not to be strong but i haven't actually put played it in this meta so i'm not 100 percent sure how it lines up but i'm i'm pretty confident that it's still a very good deck to play and i know that I've seen a few people qualify with Cyclone Mage even after the new expansion has come out. Well, we are going to find out right now how how fun it is, or you know, what, whether uh, how these new matchups play out as we try it. Um, so this will be the end of the podcast. If you're listening to this to this on um, i iTunes or on Anchor, but if you are interested to see some games with Zabe, then come check out the YouTube video, uh, YouTube.com/slash/KinsanityHS. Uh, man, I really like those those big spell mages. The puzzle of Yog Siren or whatever that card is. That card is so cool. I like King Pharaohus or whatever. And I just the uh, Naga Sandwich. You know, making all those those bigger spells cheaper is pretty crazy. I love that deck. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, Mage is doing a lot of interesting things right now. It's it's really cool that Mage is good because. Summoner Mage was first the thing when people started experimenting with Conjurer Scholling. People thought Mage just wasn't a viable deck, even even then. But it's it's gone from not being a viable deck to something that's been at the at tier one for so long, which is which is really cool to see. But yeah, there are a lot of really interesting decks right now. I think the expansion was really great, a lot of great card design, and it's awesome seeing so many new interesting things. Definitely, I like I like how the quests. Um... They're they're much easier to complete this time around, um, and you know they're, they're pretty powerful as well. So it's interesting to see what new decks uh, pop up. But uh, so should we try? Should we just stick with the primary list that you put up? Yeah, I think the primary is probably a good move for ladder. Cool. Let's do it. I'm gonna jump into a game right now. Let's do two games. I think we. I mean, if you if you got time for two, let's let's pop out two games. Okay, sounds good to me. Well, yeah, well, it'll be interesting to see how. Cyclone Mage lines up with the meta decks right now because I actually haven't uh, played any with it on ladder. All right, that's gonna be fun. You know, I actually never, never, ever played Cyclone Mage. I've only played uh, like the Quest Mage version in Wild, 
which was so crazy. Like, I mean, it was ridiculously crazy deck, but, uh, you know, the, the standard version is a lot slower, it's, it, and it plays out a lot differently, so this will be an experience for me. So, I mean, like, it could be aggro rogue, it could be um, quest rogue, like... Right, um, it, it's, it's kind of hard for me to say what people are playing at, at rank 9. I know, I know aggro mage has been on the rise the last few days. Um, I, I think either way you're probably not keeping any of these cards. We, I think we really would just want to look for a cyclone and apprentice, maybe a arcane intellect here. So, I mean, if the, if you knew for sure that this was like an aggressive matchup like zoo or something, would any of these cards be keepable like ray of frost or banana buffoon? Would those be cards that you would ever think of keeping or are you always looking for the power cards like apprentice intellect sea giant, I guess. It yeah, I think, I think ray of frost and banana buffoon could be keeps if you already had apprentice, mm -hmm. but if you don't have apprentice, then you really just want to find your apprentice. Um, but it's always tough to say with Ray of Frost because it does do some good things against early aggression, but then if you don't have any follow-up after that, it can be kind of awkward. Okay, so now, just looking at our hand, we can already see that our hand is trying to tell us that we want to play a Cyclone turn because we're going to have these bananas. We'll see how things change, but mm -hmm. just look at our hand early. That's, that's what it's uh, trying to tell us. So, I mean, like, Sorcerer's Apprentice, that's a card we'd really love to see, right? I think. Absolutely. Okay, so now, interestingly, things might things might change now because we don't really have a great way to get this Cyclone out, and now we have a Giant, and mm -hmm. playing this Banana Buffoon will make our Giant um, three mana next turn. So, so and... yeah, I think the Banana Buffoon is a good play here. Yeah, it's so crazy how like the the um, the best line of play, I guess, quote unquote, best line of play changes so quickly, like just based on that draw, you know, like. So if we go this three. Like, is there, I mean, I, I'm going giant first, but is there any uh, thought about doing something like coin, double bananas, evocation, cyclone mage, just to. I don't, I don't think so. I think what we want to do is make a really big cyclone turn when we have a chance. I think the question here is whether we feel like we need to ray a frost or not. And. What would make us want a Ray of Frost is just thinking that they might have some removal to clear this giant. Also, we have one mana, um, mm, no. and it's it's pretty good to use your mana early on. So the, the way they could kill this is just having a Vendetta. And since they played the Blink Box, they might have the Vendetta, so it might be good to just Ray of Frost here. I'm not 100% sure what this deck plays. Mm. So I'm, I'm thinking if they're playing Blink Fox, they're probably playing Vendetta. But yeah, I think the Ray of Frost is good here. I think that's probably all we're doing this turn. Okay, we're going to mill a card, but I don't think we really care about that. So, I mean, this is pretty much the same situation, right? That just... Yeah, but we have two mana now, so I don't know if we want to float a mana. Um, I think using our hero power is fine. The question is whether we want to use our hero power on a minion or whether we want to just send it face. I think sending it face is probably fine because this giant trades into the minions but i think we want to keep ray of frost for the uh cyclone
So the thing with Cyclone Mage is it's it's a scary deck to play because when you're getting pressure down like this, mm -hmm. you feel the need to it, you really you're, you're scared of dying, so you really want to just like play your cards. But a lot of the time, the way you win is just holding on to your your cards and making a powerful enough turn that you're able to swing things. So if we don't get good draw, that's how we lose this game. But mm. if we draw, if we draw well, we'll be able to swing it. Cool. I mean, that's cool. That's like a lot of resource to get rid of that, right? So. I mean. Yep. Yep. Okay. So that's that's the draw. That's the draw. Okay. So this. Uh, we can we can play we have two novas um okay let's see so the way the way you do the math is we know we're playing two minions so our hand size goes from 10 to 8 and we're not playing any twin spells so we're gonna end with eight cards mm -hmm. so we can play a frost nova we could ray of frost the uh four three double banana our sorcerer's apprentice I think it's fine to just use the coin too for an extra spell. So coin, Evo, and then Cyclone, and then see what we get. And we'll probably be able to ping down this 4-1 if nothing else. Wow. Right, let me see if I don't do this. Fuck. I think the splitting image is probably good. Yep. Good. Damn, that is so ridiculous. How did that happen? <laughs> oh. Yeah, I mean, and and that's the thing. It's really, it's very difficult to hold on to your cards the right amount of time, because like if you're really about to die, you might just feel like, okay, I have to play my stuff here, but you're you're just never giving yourself a chance there. You're just hoping that you top deck the apprentice so that you can make a big turn. <laughs> oh my god. Yep, and this is what we expected, so the splitting image was good here. Uh, okay, this could be anything. Uh, what do we got here? I kind of just want to so play this maybe... Drake into... Well, maybe not into a Sea Giant. Oh, yeah, Drake into the Sea maybe. Giant and trade out the poison. Well, we wouldn't have enough mana for that, right? It would be three, and then the Sea Giant would be five. I think maybe we test for Mirror Entity first by dropping the two-mana okay. minion. It would be four, right? Because we make a two-one. Oh, right, right. Yeah. I, I forgot about yeah. that. Um, oh, we can try the Mirror yeah. Entity. Whoa. We can play the two-mana minion to test for Mirror Entity. It might be um, like Flame Ward or something, but... Sure, let's try it out. Okay. Yeah, I think playing the Sea Giant is good here, and then we can see what the rest of our turn looks like. I guess we want to, yep, value trade, and then also value trade the 2 2 into the 1 1 so he doesn't get that free trade. So even though we did do a really big cyclone turn, we didn't get huge payout. We got the pocket galaxy and then we top the pocket uh, top deck the pocket galaxy which isn't great for us but we're definitely not behind yeah no oh, i feel super far ahead <laughs> like like i mean he's got to trade everything to get rid of the all our big stuff so uh, yeah yeah I, I think we are Four, seven, eight. Uh... I'm just gonna play the pocket galaxy, and then I'm gonna just trade some stuff out. Attack face, play the entity, maybe. Yeah. So I think the question we start to ask ourselves now is, how do we lose this game? Um, I mean, if he clears the board and may gets the board back, but I don't. Yeah, so I think the way we lose this game is we just 
kind of draw dead and we give them time to get back on the board so i don't mind playing pocket galaxy here because we've given ourselves enough time and uh wiggle room now to play the pocket galaxy which makes our draws that much better I'm gonna trade out on the board and I'm gonna play the Drake and the Apprentice. Or do I need to play the Apprentice? Probably not, right? I can, I can just play like a giant. That, that is that is a good question. Or do I even want to play the giant now? Because I could just save it for value, right? For a conjurer's calling I think, that I haven't drawn. I think, I think we definitely want to play the giant. Otherwise, we're not keeping the pressure up. So. We're always trading these two minions, so I think we probably want to play the Apprentice just so we have another minion out on board. That way they don't just dagger down the 3-1 and then we're only left with the Giant. Okay. Ouch. <laughs> oh, well, that happens. This is one of the things I really like about, like, uh, Burgle Rogue, though, is, like, how flexible it can be. I will be your doom. Ready? I'm yep, and I think we go ahead and play the Banana Buffoon, too. Do we buff this guy, like, one... Uh, I guess it doesn't matter, because it'll die to backstab... Oh, no, backstabs are gone, so... Yeah, the only consideration is playing Banana on the uh, Buffoon twice to keep it out of range of getting uh, hit by this dagger. But what we're doing by saving the Bananas is making Antonitis better and also making our Cyclone better. Um, Let's save. I, I think I like saving. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think so too. Oh, we're like halfway through our deck here. Uh. So actually... Milling the Stargazer Luna was actually pretty bad for us. If we if we did not mill that card, we probably always win. So that was really unlucky. Usually you don't care about whatever you mill, um, but our opponent did get pretty lucky here, milling probably the best card in the deck. Our draws are getting a little awkward. Um, do we want to hit? Do we want to hit that? I think we want uh. to be pressuring face. So, Six. what what are you thinking? Uh, yeah, I think we go face. I mean, I guess we could go face because then he still has to use. Assuming he doesn't have anything like reactive in hand, like. He still has to use the weapon and the the mugger to kill this marsh drake. So, and we could f we could flame strike yeah. and just fucking go phase. I think so. I think the flame strike is actually really valuable because we're drawing really dead. So, if they're able to stabilize on board again, we're just going to clear with flame strike. So, I think we actually want we want to go face. And I think double ray of frost to three three and then ping it just to go ahead and kill it. Is a is a good idea here. Okay. So now the answer to our question, how do we lose, is not necessarily lose board because we have the flame strike. Okay, well, that's a little annoying to deal with. But I think it's just taking this three damage to face every turn. Mm -hmm. And we're just drawing really, really badly at this point. I, I, I kind of got to use this, right? Like, I got to kill this 510 off pretty soon.
Yeah, the question is whether we want to use a um, Frost Nova to let them develop more or if you want to go ahead and Flame Strike. So, what, so we know two of their cards in hand are off of Pilfers, right? Is that, yeah. is that what it is? Correct. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, it might it might be best to just go ahead and flame strike since it's expensive. No, we we got four turns. Oh, we we got it. We got it. We, we we're good. We only got like fourteen cards. Like, what do we? What's nice to see here? Arcane intellect. Yeah, uh, I mean, this is this is just a. Um, Oh, wow. oh my god, what? Okay, well, you know what? It's great. We only got half of the half of the cards to pull through. Okay, so we definitely want to play that. Look for an arcane intellect. That'd be great. Okay. Uh, uh, this is okay too, I think at right? At this point, like, we. What are you thinking? I mean, I think you know, assuming whatever six cards we have left. Uh. I, I, I think we take the the research project. Like I don't I don't think. Yeah, I, think I think so too. I think our draws are better than theirs, and I think we need to end the game. Ooh. Okay. Oh, okay. So I mean, this is kind of tricky. We only got four cards left. So. Yeah. I mean, we had to do something. I think we have to play the intellect here. Okay. Hopefully, we have Antonitis still in our deck. Okay. How about okay. a wow. bunch of snip okay. snips? I guess, do we ever, do we get there with, I mean, I guess we have to do it to just play something. Yeah, this is unfortunate. I think we definitely outplayed our opponent in this game, but we drew really poorly and didn't get any cycle. And now the cards that were destroyed by Void Contract were our minions, it seems. Dude, that was so crazy. Like, I can't believe that happened. Oh, well. Okay, two, three, top. Uh, some... Okay. We got one card left. Let me make a card here. I'm not even... Uh, I'm not sure what we could get that helps us here. All right, here. We'll take this and then... I guess. Cadgar into this. What are you thinking? Yeah, I think that's probably correct here. I mean, it, it has to be correct. So, yeah, we're going to make sure that we clear off some stuff first because we'll get four minions. We got it. We're good. I mean, if we win this game, that's how you know we played it very well because our draws were very. What is this? What is this? Suboptimal. Oh, okay. If it doesn't clear it, we're still good. Oh my god. No, there's a void. Oh no, there's a twisting nether. Oh, he cleared the last card in our well, deck. Mean, Are you serious? <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah, I mean, there's, oh, God. there's just... There's nothing we could have done this game. That happens. All right, well, you know what? I feel... I like it. I, I feel... Uh, I feel pretty good about... Uh, about how we piloted in general, right? Like... I mean, there was that one turn with the where we debated about using the spell with the Mountain Giant, and then he sapped the Mountain Giant, and we burned the Luna... But, like, the reasoning for not using the spell felt pretty good. So, I, you know, I'm not, I mean, that's going to happen, right? Like, Yeah. <laughs> yeah so, so this is where we ask ourselves, okay, well, we lost the game. Did we lose because we played it poorly 
or was it just totally out of, out of our hand? And even if we feel like um, there isn't anything that we could have done, it's good to ask ourselves, okay, well, what, what could have changed the course of the game? And that game, what could have ch changed the game was playing a banana instead of playing Ray of Frost. The mm -hmm. question is whether that's correct or not. And given the downside, which was sap into milling a card, into milling an important card, um, and then asking ourselves, okay, well, what's what's the cost of playing a banana? Which is not really that much. So maybe if we play the banana there, put our hand at eight, and then we don't mill a card from sap, we probably we probably always win the game there. So I think that's the one play we could have made differently, and it probably would have won us the game. So just asking those small questions like that and trying to pick out one little thing is uh is usually how i reflect after each game cool i mean i should have definitely thought about the sap like you know sap rogues pretty much always i guess they always i mean it's so hard like especially when a new expansion comes out to kind of figure out what someone's 30 cards look like or even if they're playing an archetype that's popular it's just so tricky to know what to play around right and i i actually pulled up um, the most popular quest rogue deck to uh, just kind of look at it while we were playing the game and it doesn't run sap so that's why I didn't think about that mm -hmm. so that I don't necessarily think it's a misplay um, but if we knew that they were playing sap then that's what our play would have been so it probably wasn't a misplay given that cool um, Cadgar naked is never like I mean and there'd be no reason to do it right because we have no real follow up to give us any benefit off of his power right so i'm just pretty much wasting cat guard by playing him out so yeah if there is consideration to playing this cat guard as a 2-2 um we're not we're not playing this cyclone um this this is one of the most de uh, difficult decisions playing this deck um i'm i'm honestly fine with either i think either is a is a fine play. What Let's are you do towards? it. Okay. I, yeah, I want to experiment. I want to see what we can get. Cadgar is probably not going to be to super high value, and it gives us a chance to try to proc one of these secrets or um, fight for board early. Ah. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Oh, man. That's. What, what, what could it be? So should I just attack the face and then play Arcane Intellect? I think attacking the face is correct, and we can see if a secret procs. Okay, cool. No, that works out well. Okay. I don't think we're playing Intellect because, one, we want to stop some pressure, and also, since we have the Pocket Galaxy in hand, playing Pocket Galaxy and then Intellect after that, especially with the mm. Luna in hand, is... is uh, pretty big so i think just playing the banana buffoon also fills our uh, hand with bananas which we could use for the cyclone so i think the buffoon does a few good things here if we didn't have the buffoon in hand would you would you play the stargazer luna in that situation or would you just maybe hero power or something instead that's 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 a good question um Uh, maybe maybe we would intellect there because the Luna dies really easily and we don't want to do anything against a relatively aggressive deck. Okay. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna put a banana in here and kill try to kill off the Seeker Keeper. I mean because that way if it's uh freezing trap then you know at least I my hand won't I still have a little bit of space in my hand. Okay, so it could be pressure plate. Is there a... How bad do we feel if we play oh, yeah, banana and then our... Um, I'm actually just attacking hero power. Mm -hmm. Cyclone. Sort of, oh, yeah, yeah, I think I think attacking in hero power is probably better because if we play the banana buffoon and pressure plate goes off, we feel really bad. Okay, how about Sorcerer's Apprentice into Cyclone with two bananas? Um, yeah, I think that's probably fine because our next turn is already mapped out. And we're already taking a good bit of pressure. So 
so yeah at the beginning of the turn we weren't sure if we wanted to do that because we weren't sure if they had rat trap but we figured out what the secret was son of a all right okay well hmm I think we, uh, I still feel like we pocket Galaxy here because I can s still trade and now I'll only take three next turn. Yeah, so what we ask ourselves here is, okay, are we ahead or behind? And it seems pretty clear that we're behind right now. We're taking yeah. a lot of pressure. Um, we're at 18 against a very aggressive deck. So, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. So how do we win we have to do some really crazy stuff and we can't do crazy stuff with our hand right now so i think we had to play pocket galaxy and the we just have to hope for a really big payoff with luna or arcane intellect so yeah i think pocket galaxy and then making some trades is correct here and i kill off the secret keeper or do i um that's a good question i think maybe we kill off the three four because they already played two secrets it's not. It's more likely than not that they don't have another secret in hand because they probably play like five secrets. Cool. So now we're really looking for a cheap spell off the top so we can just really go in with um, Stargazer Luna, but we'll see what we draw. Okay, that's that's perfect. So I think we just go ahead and just play Luna and then image and then see what happens. The future is ours. Hmm. Behold the tools of creation. Okay. Yep, I think we play that. We we really value the card draw. Um we already have a conjurer's calling. I think we go ahead and just play magic trick since it's the cheapest. Okay, and the Ray of Frost is great here, so now we can freeze the 4-3. Oh my god. Ah. Uh, Seems... Uh, oh, well, okay, so that's that's interesting. Okay. So next turn, if we don't play it, we could actually just go Giant, Cadgar, Conjurer's Calling. Is that better than playing it now? Um, so they do play... They do play Deadly Shot. I'm, I'm guessing they do, so maybe... It... No, I'm feeling good about it. I'm feeling pretty good about it. Okay. Okay. Maybe we get another one. I think... Oh, shit. I think it's close. Okay, yeah. Nice. See, this is... This is... So we asked ourselves the question, how do we win this game? And the answer was, we had to do really crazy stuff with Pocky Galaxy and Luna, and that's exactly what we did. Yeah, we... we so you're always yeah, asking those questions when you're playing this deck. 16, 18, do I have a frost now? Uh, okay, well, this is it. Can I, would you fight off, fight for the board here, or? I think the I mean, only can way I we almost lose now win right is, here? I think the only way we lose now is not killing their board off. So I think we make some trades and then we're going to uh, Cadgar Conjure. So yeah, if you hit that first, and now, yep. Cadgar Conjure. So we could, or we could just double Conjure. Um, that would increase our chances of getting no, let's taunts do with the... Okay. Yeah, I mean, we're not changing our clock by like going face. So I think just killing the two three is fine, and we could, we could even just play an Antonitis just to get more pressure on the board. I don't think there's really. Man, that's a wild, here. wild turn. That is so ridiculous. Yeah, and I think what would happen for a lot of players is they would see that they're really far behind, and then they would try to play their minions on that turn where we play Pocky Galaxy. But you have to recognize. Like, what's actually going to win you the game? Nothing. 
Yeah, this was this was a really good demonstration of what this deck does well and the difficulties of it. So, like I like I've highlighted a few times, it's pretty difficult there to not play on the board when you're getting pressure down so hard. But like I said, it's really important to recognize um, what that's doing for you, which is essentially nothing, and how we win the game, which is just doing really insane stuff. So the pocket galaxy into the Luna into just doing really, really stupid stuff is how we won that game. That was that was crazy, man. I man, that that was pretty fun. Like I've never played that. And I'm that's that's pretty interesting. I'm I'm gonna I think I'm gonna try to pilot it for like a week or something. This next week I'll just maybe try to play a little bit more of it. Hey Zay, thank you so much for jumping on the podcast and, and you know running through a couple games with Pocket Galaxy uh, uh, with me, man. I really appreciate you jumping on, and I, I hope you best of luck in the in the tournament, man. Thank you so much. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. Thanks again for inviting me on, Ken. Thank you, man. I, I will talk to you soon, and you should see this episode's up in a couple of days, if not tomorrow, then the day after. Okay, sounds great. Yeah, have a good rest of your day. You too, man. Take it easy.